Well, well, hi, everybody. Happy New Year. Um, welcome back to the show. Uh, another episode of uh, Speed Tips by Bob and Chad. Hi, Chad. How are you today? Doing pretty good. Happy New Year, everybody. Yeah. We all survived Christmas. We all survived New Year's. And like I told Bobby, I said, now tomorrow we can all go back to work and get back to a normal life. And we can start sipping stuff like we're supposed to and doing all that just ordinary stuff that we normally do. So excited about that. I, I love the holidays, but I, from the business aspect, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad when they're all done. Yeah, a couple three-day weekends here. It's going to be nice to get back to normal. I know it's nice well, to have some time off, but. Yeah, it is. It's just, uh, you know, like I said, it's one of those deals where whatever is the, the case. Uh, apologize for those of you who are hopefully listening that we didn't get an actual post out earlier in time. Of course, that's uh, the lady that does that for me. She kind of takes vacation between the holidays because her, her kids are usually home from college or whatever. And, and so, and, and I actually forgot about it until, well, actually right before you called, uh, I was thinking I hadn't seen one. And I'm thinking, I wonder if we did a post on that. I didn't see one. So, so hopefully people know about it. I was going to, uh, uh, get started in talking about our off-season maintenance and, and some things like that. Um, yeah, we've been we've been getting all kinds of calls for slider maintenance and and the cages and you know putting fresh bearings in the suspension cages and all that stuff. So definitely that time of year. Yeah, it is. You know, I mean, a lot of people are getting going a little earlier and. There's still a few people that are, you know, just getting going on their stuff. And then there's a lot of people that are racing down there in Cocopa this week. And so, um, you know, their stuff's already been gone through and ready to go. And uh, we just did a, a turnkey USMTS car for a customer that uh, going down there to New Mexico or wherever they're racing this weekend. And he, I think he... He was leaving today, picked up the car on Friday, and was planning on leaving today. So uh, they finished lettering it there at the shop on Friday and and uh, were putting the decals on it. And, and car turned out really nice. He started it up and drove it out of there. I'm like, whoa, that's no crate motor. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. A nice brand new Mullins motor in there. And I'm like, woof. Just, nothing uh, nothing better than an off-season smell of the old race gas, is there? Oh, yeah. I thought that was pretty good. I was really excited. They put it in gear and it moved. And I'm like, whoa, boy, Brandon did a hell of a job. Everything's going good. It started up and it moved on its own power. Well, hell, we're good, man. So I tried to talk him in, the, the customer, I tried to talk him into waiting until the next show to kind of not be rushing it, but. He was pretty adamant he was going down there. So it's like, whatever you got to do. What's new and exciting at Where's Machine? Anything going on? What's the latest update on the app? So after we we talked about it there a couple of weeks ago on this deal and uh, had some people asking questions there and wanting to be able to have the whole team log in, and be able to view the data. So after after that show that night, we had a meeting the next day and talked about it and talked to some of my other guys that, that race and, and they kind of thought that would be a better way to go. So uh, the app's pretty much ready to go. We pushed it out a little bit to make sure that we can do the, the storage of the data and have multiple people log in. So the the original idea is a very easy app to create. The, the idea of having multiple people be able to log into that app is a whole different platform and a whole different way of looking at it. So it's going to take a, a little bit longer, but you know, I, I feel like uh, that was a being, it was like the first and second questions. I feel like that's the most important thing is that, you know, if you're, especially if you're gonna have a maintenance deal and you're gonna have a bunch of different people logging in there to do the deal. I mean, 
You yeah. don't want to fight over the same phone and the same tablet. So, you know, I've, I just felt like that was maybe a very important deal to enough to push back the launch date. So I'd rather launch it and have everybody be happy than launch it and, and then have to retract and start over. So we're looking probably, they're telling me about January 15th, we should be ready to rock. So uh, I assume we're going to go every other week here. So we'll know more right. of that Monday and, and, you know, hopefully they can get that dialed in and then we can, we can launch it. We're, we're excited. Everybody that's looked at it is excited about it. So, but you know, we want to do it right the first time. So. Well, it's going to be super cool. I mean, you know, it, it's like I've told my customers, I mean, for the price, of, you know, there's there's so many things that that app can do, all depending on how much how much you want to use it and how much information you want to put in it yourself to make it for you to be able to use it to its fullest. But even if you don't use it to its fullest, there's so many neat things that that thing can do. The, the, the price is... I mean, it's well worth the, the the price, even if you can't use all of this stuff. I mean, you know, I told a customer the other day, I said, you just need it. I mean, you know, and, and I said, you know, we're going to work with you on trying to get some, you know, like some of our network stuff put in there so that, you know, Joe Blow has a customer, has a GRT car from us or whatever, you know, that we can already get it so that it can be just downloaded or however it works to put it in there excuse me yeah with the, the being able to do multiple chassis you guys could pretty much log every car you build and have all the measurements for each car you build and, right. and the components you put on it and then build that app for that racer and then they get that app with the car so that's that's one other thing like ryan uh ryan from jarevitz he puts together rages and he was saying the same thing he can have everybody's cars logged in there and then be able to when joe blow calls he can look up in the phone and see what the measurement was on his car so it's going to make life easier for you guys that are putting cars together also yeah no i think it's a a, a sweet deal um yeah jeffrey says fresh fresh fuel smells better than old fuel there's no doubt about that question b mod could you uh, repeat repeat cure for the fix on the right front 50 degree hotter than the left rear um, I'll run down about could you repeat cure for the fix on the right rear oh the right rear right right front right rear 50 degrees hotter than the left rear well the biggest thing is what's happening is is that right rear is actually not biting uh, the car believe it or not, that's the tire that's sliding. A lot of times it's driver specific. You know, if the driver's setting the car at the flag stand and he's got the car sideways quite a ways through the middle of the corner, that's going to cause the car to run hot. Uh, you need to feed that tire, put some more, you know, more load into that tire uh, and get that, uh, my gosh, my nose is... I don't know what that's all about, but anyway, um, making sure that the car is more balanced because it sounds to me like the car's just got way too much left rear bite in it, and the right rear is just skating out there, just doing what it's not supposed to do. So that's the biggest thing is getting a little bit more side bite in the car, uh, less left rear, uh, and get get some more bite in that right rear tire because the, the car is unbalanced when the right rear is that hot, or it's a driver issue with, like I said, the driver setting the car real early, sliding the car all the way through the corner, you know, and trying to ride the car off the right rear, but the right rear doesn't have the grip. You know, it's maybe you got too much angle in the right rear, too much steer in the right rear, you know, things like that. Um, how much is it to you? The app's going to be a hundred dollars. Oh, okay. Um, some average load numbers on a sport mod. Well, it's a little hard to actually give you some average load numbers because each car is a little bit different. But to give you a, you know, a, a kind of an average number, and this is just a shot in the dark 
kind of, but from what we have experienced on some of our stuff, anywhere from about 1250 to 1350, 1375, those numbers seem to be pretty good. Now that's three inches of travel. Now, if you check it, uh, three and a half inches of travel, that load number is going to be different. If you check it at two and a half inches of in load, that's going to be different. But where we check ours at three inches of travel, uh, that's pretty normal on, on a GRT Sport Mod, depending on the spring rate. Uh, that's pretty normal. Uh, we, we've had, uh, that's a pretty common number. Uh, newer to running modifieds, what are the advantages to running a torque arm versus a pull bar, vice versa? My brother and I bought a 2017 GRT and have a torque arm and a pull bar set up available. We just aren't sure what to go with. Um, well, it kind of depends on what you're running. If you're running USRA, or if you run an IMCA, if you run an IMCA, you have to run a torque link because, or the pull bar, because the torque arm is not legal. Um, anything that has minimal traction, I think the the pull bar is going to have more traction. The torque arm works pretty good on racetracks that are very momentum based where you have a lot of speed and instant traction is not as big a deal where you're more, you're more apt to wanting overall speed, better corner speed. Um, that's where I would go with the uh, pull bar, but overall traction wise, um, or I mean the torque arm overall, the pull bar is going to have more traction. Um, it's just, they just do. Um, brake pads on a hobby stock. What would you recommend in the rear? Well, how is run a, a relatively aggressive, um, pad? Um, now I'm assuming that you can run high performance stuff. Um, Willwood and AFCO both have an excellent pad. Um, I don't actually have the numbers uh, in the in my head what actual pads to run, but whichever they have the more aggressive pad, uh, I would definitely whoever you buy your pads from, uh, I'd tell them you want a, a fairly aggressive rear pad like what the modifieds run. Uh, that's going to work really well. Um, cause you've got to run that master cylinder that, um, uh, in fact, if I remember at hobby stocks, you can't run an actual, you've got to run a stock master cylinder. Uh, and so you're, you've got to go with more, you got to use brake pads to get more bias because you can't do it with the master cylinder like what you can in other things. Um, anyway, on the off season, what, what'd you say? How's the school looking? Uh, schools are looking good. Um, the uh, sport mod school is sold out. Uh, we don't have any spots left for that one. That's our first school. The uh, modified school or the four link school. Um, we've got a stellar group of people coming coming for that. You know, of course, Chad's going to be there. Ben Baker's going to be there. Uh, Riley Hatfield from El Dor uh, Dorado Speed Shop's going to be there. Uh, I'll be there. Jake McBurney's going to be there. Um, my son will be there talking about shocks. So we've got an excellent group of people. It's going to be a great a great class. Uh, and we're, we still have some openings for that. Uh, stock car school is going to be another good one. Uh, we've got uh, uh, Mike Nichols. I think he's a seven or eight time national champions in, in a stock car. Uh, well, Troy Jarevitz there. He just won that big race at Batesville last fall. Uh, he's going to be part of our group. 
And of course, Bobby and I will be there. And uh, Paul Berger from B and B Chassis, he'll be our chassis guy there. So that's going to be another good one. And that uh, uh, that's the last weekend in the four leg schools. The first weekend in in February and the uh, stock car school is the last weekend in February. It's the weekend after Daytona. The um, but it, excellent schools. Yeah, we're we're really looking forward to it. Of course, I always look forward to the schools. I think they're a lot of fun. I have a good time doing them. Um, you learn so much. I mean, you know, and I'm always learning. It just seems like every school, like last year. I mean, you know, some of the stuff that Riley was talking about. You know, I'm like, oh, that's a different way to think about that. You know, I hadn't thought about that. You know. And I've been doing this for 40 years. And so you're always learning. And uh, so it's pretty cool. Uh, Luke wants to know, do you recommend running mud covers on a sport mod? Uh, I would run a mud cover on anything that is legal to run a mud cover on. Um, the, the advantage to having a mud cover is it, it, it keeps – you wouldn't think you'd want to keep heat in your brakes, but overall, it's a lot better situation to keep them, especially on the right front. Uh, definitely run one on there because it helps keep the tire heat and keeps the brake heat, making the tire stay warm. So on restarts, if the right front doesn't go away, uh, right rear, you almost need to have a mud cover with a beadlock on there. That thing fills up with mud and shake the fillings out of your teeth, man. So, anyway, needless to say, definitely doing that. Um, Bill wants to know about placing ballast on the right front corner of a car. Okay, or mainly slick racetracks? You know, I've done that a lot. Um, some people get a little carried away. Uh, I don't think... Um, I don't think you need to have a big chunk of weight up there. A 20-pound chunk of weight can be an advantage, uh, especially on a slick racetrack, because number one, the, you have to remember on a slick racetrack, your, your corner speed slows down. So sometimes getting the car over on the right front and getting that extra grip on that right front tire is a big deal, because when your corner speed slows down, then it's going to also slow the heat range in that tire down because it's not going to put the load on there. So sometimes using a chunk of weight over there works pretty good. I'm not a big fan of it on a real heavy type of racetrack, but then again, you know, it kind of just depends. Some guys run it all the time. They like the way the car drives with it up there and, and, and it works good. Uh, Nathan, any hobby stock advice? Well, Kind of all depends on where you want to start. Uh, you know, I'm personally not as familiar with the hobby stock cars. You know, my son Bobby and and uh, my other shot guy Braden Reynolds, uh, he ran a hobby stock, so he's kind of like when people call with hobby stock questions, he's kind of the one that gets to do the tech info on that. Uh, so if you had a specific question, I would do my best to answer it. Chris, if I watch Stock Car School on IMCA TV, can I get paperwork you give out? And if you attend the class in person, yes. Uh, if you sign up on IMCA TV to get one of the classes, you get the actual same exact book. Uh, we ship that book to you. Now, the guys that sign up at the last minute is a little bit tough. Then all of a sudden, we've got to actually email them the book uh, in, a, in a Word document so they can print it out themselves. Otherwise, as long as we have a week in advance, if you order the school, we'll send you the actual manual just like what we would get, uh, what you would get at the school. Are all three of them broadcast? All three of them are broadcast. Uh, the 
all three cars, and it's actually IMCA TV or racetechinfo.tv. Either one, it's on both of them. So, and we've actually had, uh, we've had some, especially the sport modeling, because it's sold out. We've had some people um, buy it online. And, and the thing, the advantage to buying it online is the fact you get that school for a year. So you, if you want to go back and rewatch something, you have access to that school for a full year. So, you know, for somebody who can't travel here, or whatever, you know, the things, the disadvantage to the school is you don't get that interaction with the people like you would in the actual live school. But the other advantage is, is you, you get that school for a full year. So you can go back and you, you could actually watch that school. I, mean, I don't know how many times you want to watch that school, but I mean, I'm an exciting guy, and I understand people really want to watch me. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. So no, it's it's it's, it's a big benefit. Yeah, Rick just bought on there. He bought it online, and it's like my Bible all year, and, and it is. I mean, you can go back and and, and watch as much as you want. So, it's, but anyway. Uh, Clayton, is there any difference to running the pull bar shock mounted to the side of the pull bar versus above the pull bar? For example, the dirt star pull bar setup. Well, what it does when you run the, the axle dampener shock in line with the pull bar itself, what it actually does is it actually works a little bit more with the pull bar itself and kind of helps unload and ha or helps the unload process of the pull bar. And it, it's a little bit more forgiving. When you run it on top of the housing, it'll actually make the car actually run on a little bit. You can make the car tighter with it on top of the housing. It's, it's going to, it kind of works totally different in a sense. Uh, it still regulates the down mode, but what it does is it also will help get the car on the right front more, uh, where with it being in line with the pull bar, it, it just regulates the actual pull bar movement and, and, and makes the pull bar movement smoother. So it works pretty well with that. Um, uh, oh, who's the Wisconsin chassis builder? They were the first ones to actually put it down there. MB. Uh, yeah, MB, MB Custom. Uh, they always ran it down there. And, and like I said, it works pretty slick. We've tried it both ways, and, and I like it on an IMCA car. I like it better on top of the housing. Uh, on an open car, I think it would probably be better down there along with the pull bar. Uh, Chad, can you explain a little bit about your app and what it can do? Or do you guys got some info on your website for it? So they're they're currently working on the website for it also. Um, well this, so this is this is the front page of it. So that's the main main categories that you got to deal with there. So you're going to have a parts list, a maintenance list, all your measurements, your race day notes, a setup book, and then trackside tuning. So that's the six main sections of it. And then there's also a chassis section where you can create different cars. So if you have a stock car and a modified, you go in there and you have a, a list for your stock car and your modified. And then on the, the tuning side of it, you pick what you have. So... You know, they're, when you're in the tuning, kind of tough to show that, but when you're in the tuning, there's a drop down for to select what kind of car you got. I don't know if you can see that. So you got modified, B mod, late model, stock car, and then all the tuning adjustments are based on that chassis or that car. So it's, there's, you know, like we've been saying, there's all kinds of 
all kinds of sections in there, whether you just use the maintenance or just use the trackside tuning or just the setup book or you use it all. I mean, the, the thing about using it all is that there's a lot of, lot of data input. So uh, one of the theories and, and all the softwares and everything that we talk about here, you know, even in manufacturing is you can have cool software, but if you put crap in, you get crap out. So uh, it's going to be one of them deals. It's going to be a lot of data entry instead of writing it in a notebook then you got to type it into the either the ipad or the the phone that you're using so but you know like i said this is a this has been a year in the making at least you know i don't know when the, the first time we started talking i think it was two years ago in school yeah. out east is when we kind of started talking about it um and then spent a lot of different people's input that have been involved you know bob's had a, a big influence on it and uh it's just a collaboration of a lot of people trying to make one of the coolest virtual notebooks you can have. So, I mean, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Cool. Very cool. Well, like I said, it's definitely going to be a cool deal. I mean, it's, it, it's endless what you can use that thing for. Um, and like Chad said, I mean, it all depends on what you want to put into it, what you want to get out of it. But it, even if you put minimal information in it, there's so much information stored in that of, of recommendations and, and how to tune the chassis if you have a loose condition or a tight condition. All that information has been already documented and it's already been put in that. So even if you don't put anything in there, just all the tips that are in it's there are well worth money. Yeah. Uh, Kip wants to know what I recommend for a spring rate on a hobby stock. And Kip, man, I tell you what, I, I am really sorry. Uh, I don't know the rears. I know the fronts are, are relatively stiff. Uh, I'm thinking that overall they're running. The, the, um, like I think they're pretty much about the same as the stock car running, like a a 1200 pound left front and a, and, a, and a thousand pound right front, but don't quote me on that. Um, feel free, Kip, give us a call to shop. The uh, you know, Brayton would be more than happy to help you in any way, he'll give you all that information. And, and in fact, I will probably even ask him myself tomorrow so that I actually know because I, I, I'm just not familiar with it. Um, Bill, your thoughts on running the Helix spring on the right rear of a sport mod? I'm I'm not a big believer in it. Um, I I think on a sport mod, it's a little inconsistent. You, you, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't want to give somebody bad information, but I just don't. I'm not that. I, I think it's inconsistent. Um, it's it's wound tight enough that you know the sport mod. You, you got to remember, you know, the sport mod's kind of a. You got an open motor that has all kinds of horsepower, and then you got a crate motor that doesn't have much for horsepower. And the problem is with the tire that we have. I I just don't think that spring is useful like it like on a stock car a heavier car uh stock car stuff works pretty good but they get a lot more movement and they don't have as you know all the adjustability that the sport mod has so bill in my opinion i don't recommend it uh justin wants to know e85 or 110 and you know to be honest with you I don't even remember what I don't even know. I think they, I think it was one ten. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was one ten. Um, that that motor, it, it was it was pretty sweet. Yeah, it uh, made me think about maybe Bob needed a plane ticket, go to go to New Mexico. But then when you watch the news and you see all of the traveling things that everybody's having and all the struggles that people are having traveling anywhere, man, I don't know. I think me going from my house to Ames 25 miles a day, I'm pretty good. 
Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know if I'd be wanting to take a flight anywhere right now. I, they pretty much have me convinced that it wouldn't be the thing to do. Even though you'd be going somewhere where it would be a little bit warmer, because we can't complain about the weather we've had here. The last week's been pretty dang nice. Um, Billy, moving up to a stock car this year, what motor package would you suggest running for both USRA and ISA? Well, I'm, you guys are hitting me. I'm, I'm not doing very good tonight. I, Billy, I'm not a motor guy. I. I have no. I, I wouldn't have a clue, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, we'll I could get Stoa back on here. Yeah, well, I have to get Stoa. He, I know he makes a heck of a motor. That's when I, that would be the guy I would call. Um, Kevin Stoa uh, definitely would be. He makes. He's got. Some, that's what Mike Nichols runs his motors. Um, He's built some pretty pretty nice stuff for some stock car guys and, and had some really good luck with it. And he would be the guy, Billy, I would call. Um, I don't actually have his phone number, otherwise I'd give you that right now. But but I would definitely call Kevin Stoa. He's out of Albert Lee. Um, thanks for the info and preview of the app, Dad. Uh, what's the app called? Circle track. track, yeah, circle track app. So, uh, the only thing I guess the Facebook is up, so you could go like the Facebook page, but uh, the website is circle track app.com and that's being worked on also. Uh, so hopefully, we can get this thing done here in a couple weeks. Uh, Chris says a 360 cubic inch is most common. Well, thanks, Chris. I appreciate it. I'm glad somebody's out there listening that can help. Oh, Bob, who doesn't have a clue. The thing that I know about the motor is supposed to make the chassis and the shocks look really good. Uh, yeah, other than that, that's about all I can tell you about, about the engine. I, like I said, I do know when they fired up that USMTS motor the other day, it was like, you know, I've, it's been a while since I've actually listened to one of them. I've been used to the crate motors that you know sound like my pickup truck with mufflers off of it. And uh, they fired that thing up and then rattled, rattled the windows in the shop there. Chad, any chance you get a breakdown with your spring biscuit pull bar and how it works? So the, the spring, uh, spring bar with the biscuits inside of it. So we use, uh, I think we offer all three now. So we offer with an AFCO progressive, an IBOC progressive, or a hypercoil uh, progressive spring. They all rate fairly close. We've we've dynoed it and built that package to be pretty close. So whatever brand of spring you want to choose from, uh, they all act virtually pretty close to the same. Um, and then the inside, the pucks are tunable. So one thing I like about the spring bar is the tunability of it versus the other ones. You know, when you put the pucks inside of a can, you're kind of limited because the pucks hit the can. The spring, you can tune it with the preload pretty easy. Uh, you can put packers in the inside on them bushings to change the the engagement of your inner bushings. You can change the durometer of the inner bushings, and you don't have to worry about them hitting the wall like on the inside of the, the clothes cans. Um, or, so just the, I think the tunability, the biggest thing with the spring bar, I don't know, Jim, what you race, if it's an open or IMCA, uh, you're going to need a good dampening shock on top versus you know what you would what you would on a, a biscuit style pull bar because the spring stores more energy so when you decel into the corner it has has more decel rate than a puck would so the pucks take a split second longer to get back to their installed free height where a spring is like it's live it's it's back instantly so when you let out of the fuel that thing's going to decel hard you're going to need more shock to dampen that force so uh, definitely like the spring tunability. Uh, it's really kind of the springs have made somewhat of a comeback on the IMCA. Yeah. The, the the hard tire cars were, you know, we were pretty much doing all puck bars, and now the spring puck combos. I think that's what you guys are offering pretty much is yeah. the, all of them. Uh, you know, that's primarily what we've gone to, and we've seen the trend go back to springs 
where two or three years ago we were pretty much all pucks. So the spring definitely is uh, less maintenance also. I mean, that bar, basically you grease the, the bushings on it and rock and roll until night 25 when it's time to put, you know, a fresh spring and fresh pucks in. Um, but yeah, that's basically how this, the spring biscuit bar works. And Jim says he's a Wasoda A mod. Wasoda, yeah. So definitely on a, a stickier tire, big horsepower like that, the spring is going to control the motion a lot better than the pucks. The, the high horsepower sticky tires beat them pucks up so bad that, you know, the, the, the puck bars don't last that well on a, on a big open motor sticky tire car. Uh, like they do on the crate tire car, so like on an IMCA car. Uh, back to that pull bar shock, you know, that one of the reasons, you, one of the main reasons them guys went aside of that pull bar and went away from up is because the cars really don't fall like they used to. So when they'd fall back in the day, they'd control that motion at rear end better. When you put it right next door, you're really controlling the axle wrap. So when you excel and decel, and that axle's wrapping that has more control than it does when it's hooked up to the up to the top of the chassis. So the chassis influences then that left rear tire almost more than it does the pull bar. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. That's a good point. Good, very good point. Um, how much nose or zero point would you consider normal or typical or too much on a tie down right front? Well, Paula, it kind of depends on what you're actually running, what, what class of car you're actually running. Um, you know, like an open open motor car uh, with a big spoiler and stuff, we're, we're running three, 350, 400 pounds at zero point. Um, some of the limited stuff were a little bit less zero point. We're, you know, probably in that 150 to 250 pound range. Uh, pretty much everything that we build and we used to build some stuff that only had like 50 pounds of zero point but now you know we're figuring out more ways to get the car hooked up and get traction to the car so we don't have to worry about it and since we've got more it's it's kind of a, a vicious circle in a sense more traction we put in the car the more zero point we almost need to keep the right front uh, so that the car stays down on the nose and keep the right front going. Uh, but, you know, like I said, open open car, we're in that 350, 400 pound range. Uh, an IMCA type car, you know, we're more in that 200, 250 pound range. Stock car, we've got some guys that have tried crazy amounts of zero point. I mean, just insane amounts of zero point and been successful with it. Um, I think the thing with the zero point is it has a lot to do with the racetrack itself. Certain conditions where there's a little bit of traction still in the car, the zero point is a big factor because you can wheel that thing down in there and that thing points and sticks that right front and you can drive right around the corner. If you really struggle coming off the corner where the racetrack really, really has no grip whatsoever, or on a high momentum type racetrack, I think the zero point can be a little bit, a high zero point shot can be a little bit of a hindrance. But that's kind of the numbers we kind of go over and go, go around. So uh, hopefully that gives you some idea. Um, Well, we're we're caught up with our questions. Um, Probably go back to that maintenance list. Oh yeah, duh, <laughs> maintenance list. Um, first thing on my maintenance list that I always talk about is the chassis itself. Uh, inspect the frame completely, making sure that nothing is bent. Refer to the preseason measurements. Check for all the welds and all the tubing cracks, or check for tubing cracks, case center X, motor mounts uh, in that X where the car flexes quite a bit, or those motor mounts. Those definitely have fatigues. 
A panhard bar mount definitely is another one that fatigues quite a bit. Uh, make sure you check the fuel cell brackets because if, if you look at what actually holds these fuel cells in these cars, I mean, there's four little brackets that hold this 28 gallon fuel cell uh, in these cars. And pull bar mounts, so that's a pull bar is another one that, you know, really can get stressed. Suspension. Uh, one thing about the suspension, you know, check over all the spindles, uh, ball joints, control arms, hinds, tie rods, center links, pitman arm, and idler arm. Check and replace the grease circs if needed. Inspect, make sure that everything's greasable. Uh, inspect all rear suspension mounts on the rear end. Check the suspension cages uh, and the bearings. Uh, check the sliders for any dents or shaft nicks. Uh, sliders should be rebuilt every off season. Uh, check the springs for bow. Uh, springs, in my opinion, need to be replaced every season. Um, talk about the suspension stuff, Chad. Yeah, so, I mean, this is a good time of year to, to spin them cages. You know, a lot of a lot of the question we get, people call here and they're like, should we put bearings in? And and the answer is, if it feels good, I wouldn't put them in. So when you're when you're looking at the cages and you got the, the four link rods and the shock unhooked and you can spin that thing around and then you can grab it top and bottom and rock it. And make sure that there's no no slop in them bearings. Make sure everything feels good. Uh, one of the other biggest things is that water problem. You know, if you've got any kind of rust on the inside of that housing or on the inside of them bearing races, this would be the time to get that slid off the, the axle tube and cleaned up. And, you know, you know, if they do feel somewhat compromised, then I would knock the bearings out and put a set of bearings in. It's a lot easier to do it now in the winter, in the off season, when you got plenty of time than, you know, week four or week five, you have a bearing problem. You got to try and get it done before the next race race week. So we have a lot of customers that just put them in, in the off season just because, uh, but it's not, not completely necessary. If they feel good, just make sure they're cleaned up. And the, the, the bearings that we use, you know, they're basically greased from the factory. They're a sealed bearing. You know, we do have some guys that peel that little plastic race out of there and, and clean them. You know, if you want to be that ambitious, take them apart, take them little seals out, and then, uh, you know, clean the bearings and re-grease them with a needle greaser just like you would on your, your uh, hub bearings, you know, but don't over-grease them. The, the plastic seals on there slip back into a little groove. So if you're careful with that, we've had some guys that rebuild their their bearings that way. But, you know, if they have any kind of side rock when you grab the top and bottom of that cage, then they're compromised and you're going to want to replace them anyway. Slider, just like you said, that thing should always be put gone through in the wintertime for sure. Put a fresh bushing in it. You know, the pistons generally last quite a while, but inspect your, you know, your slider shaft and, even your shocks and you probably got to send those in and get them looked at too. But uh, definitely the rear suspension and the shocks and the springs and these things get abused. And this is the time to freshen the car up. So you're ready to rock and roll when the spring comes. Um, rear end. Um, the other thing, while you're working on your bearings and your, your rear suspension, carefully inspect the rear end itself. Measure to make sure that you don't have any axle tubes that are bent. Your nine inch Ford guys, I mean, those things bend easier than you can imagine. So, this is the time of the year to make sure you check that, check the pinions, seals, replace those if needed. Uh, check the axle seals for damage. Check the drive flange for wear. You go over that stuff very carefully because, like Chad said, now is the time where you guys have the time to go over all that stuff and look at that stuff very carefully. But here it is. Today's January 2nd. In 120 days, most everybody out here is going to be racing. And 120 days goes pretty darn fast when, you know, the only time you have to work on the car is on the weekends. So you stop and think, now how many weekends do we have before we actually race? Before you know it, we're going to be racing. I mean, it's it's, it's you know, all of a sudden you're like scrambling at the last minute. So don't do that. Set yourself a schedule of what you want to go through every week. And, and you know, and, and granted, 
you know, we get together on weekends to work on a race car. And, and so we spend 75% of the time bullshitting. Now, I don't really know if that's necessary in, in Bob's world is it actually isn't all that necessary. So make yourself lists of things. So you make your weekends productive, just like you do your weeks of your maintenance. And, and any of you who have been to my school, you can probably learn how to spell maintenance backwards because that's about what I talk about every all the time is that maintenance, 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 maintenance. Now's the time of the year to to cure all those things. So you go out at the beginning of the year, you hit the racetrack fresh, everything is good to go, and, and, and you don't have that lag of God. We, did we do that? Oh, we forgot to do that. Duh. Um, question, Jeffrey's got, Bob, where do you like the rear end brackets on the rear end on a sport mod? Well, um, I don't have actually measurements. We, we do, but I don't, I, I don't actually have that stuff in my head. Um, that'd be one thing nice about your app. I could put all that information in that app and I could look it up on my phone here. Um, anyway, the... But when we when we look at the car from the back, I want to make sure that my right rear is going forward. It's towed out one inch on the rear end side. So in other words, it's towed in as it goes forward to the chassis. And my left rear, I always make sure that my left rear is towed into the chassis two inches. And we do that just because we want a little bit more steer on the uh, uh, a little bit more steer on the left rear and a little less steer on the right rear, but we still need some steer on the right rear to make sure that the car is not too tight. So that's kind of our reason behind that. Sandra, you know, that fire suppressant um, system, I don't actually know the actual name of the one that we actually usually get. Um, Speedway Motors carries a nice unit. In fact, actually, that's when we put when we install one in the car. We actually get it from Speedway, uh, but it's uh, I don't know the brand name of it. But we're, there's we're kind of we're kind of partial to safety systems. The old fire bottle company. Oh Just yeah, there you go. Safety systems comes with a real nice bracket, made in Bangor, Wisconsin. Oh okay, good. I see well, Joey's record. Well, Joey's got a recommendation there, a lifeline. Oh, yeah, lifeline. Joey says yeah. lifeline. Thanks, Joey. Appreciate that. I know there's some nice ones. There's some very nice ones out there. Um, but like I said, I don't. The problem is, is I'm not on the phone selling some of this stuff anymore. So I get, I, I get, uh, I, I see the invoice, and that's about the extent of what I actually get to see. Um, okay. Noah, slider versus shock. Slider versus shock behind on a rough racetrack. Them big questions really move that bar quite a bit. <laughs> Boy, they do, don't they? Yeah. Slider versus shock behind on a rough racetrack on a UMP car. Um, you know, I, I really can't say that... I, you know, I, I like the um, – either way, I, I can't say that there's a big advantage or a big disadvantage either way with the shock and spring. When you when you put the shock behind the housing, you got to remember if it's on the right rear, uh, it, it works a little bit different than it does in the front because on the front it's always in a compression mode where in the rear – it is still in a compression mode, but like a shock absorber itself will actually move an inch. If you move it to the front of the right rear versus behind the right rear, it'll move one inch further on the front, same exact shock. And that's the axle wrap, like what Chad talked about uh, a little bit ago. Uh, that has quite a bit to do with it. But as far as performance on the actual car, I, I 
I can't say that there's a huge advantage one way or the other. I like the shocks in front. If if, if I was putting my car together and I had that option, um, the slider behind and the shock in front is probably my, my favorite. Um, I see a lot of Wasota cars the other way around uh, with the springs in front and the shocks behind. So it just kind of depends. Um, on a Wasota B-Mod, does mounting the right rear slider with the adjustment side up so that the top of the spring is lower is a noticeable change on the spring table or is it felt through the top of the hind? Uh, when it's mounted from hind to hind, it doesn't matter where the actual spring is. Uh, the, it, the, the actual uh, spring table is measured from the center of hind to center of hind. Uh, Tim, cars good everywhere, tailing out middle of the straightaway on a dry slick racetrack. What would you suggest? Um, if the car's tailing out on the right rear in the middle of the racetrack, that means that you're getting too much travel. Uh, you need to restrict the travel uh, of the right rear trailing arms. In other words, tighten the chain down a little bit more. Uh, because if, if, after it gets to a point where you're getting, you know, 20 degrees angle or more angle, 30 degrees, not 30, 20 degrees, 25 degrees, that's getting the car to start steering loose. And it's going to steer that car and start to unhook that right rear because of that. So definitely tighten it, put a little bit more load in the chain. Um, Ty, sport mod bouncing on a rougher racetrack as preload on the right rear and left rear spring. Compensating with preload as didn't have a higher spring. What is your take on preloading the right rear spring to compensate for rate versus just replacing the spring with a higher rate spring? I believe you guys set your BHE cars up with a 200 and 225 rear. Do you preload these at all? Uh, other than the light left rear spring, do you believe do you believe there would be any need to preload the left rear or the right rear? No, I don't preload the right rear. Um, not not at all. Uh, the left rear, if we go to that soft spring, like if we go to a 100 or a 125, we preload that left rear. But with the 200, I don't actually even preload the left rear. Uh, everything's just loaded standard. Penn Ohio Pro Stock with adjustable rear bars. Upon corner entry, my right rear is going severely to the rear. Behind the rear end, Behind, behind the right, behind the rear quarter panel. Um, let's see here. My right rear is going severely behind the right rear quarter panel. What adjustment do I need to make to try to keep the right rear a little bit more neutral, stay more centered? I've heard a lot of opinions, and I have my own. Thought I would ask the professionals. What's your opinion on that one, Chad? Well, it sounds like too much wheelbase change, so your bar angles are are probably too high. Uh, so flattening your right rear bars will lessen your wheelbase change off the corner. I assume is what you're what you're talking about. I don't know if it's if you're lead or or if you're you know standard on the right rear, but when you're going through the middle of the corner and that thing rolls over on the right rear and then bars flatten out, they're wheelbase and back, so they're wheelbase and loose. You know, so taking a little angle out, uh, flattening them right side bars will keep that wheelbase change in check coming off the corner. Yeah, I would say that's, uh, I agree 100%. That's what it sounds like to me. Like there's, uh, you've got quite a bit of angle in your right rear. And I take some of that angle out because, like Chad just said, no reason for me to repeat it. But when you have all that angle in there and the car rolls over, it's going to lengthen that wheelbase and make the car free. Uh, Gary, what's your opinion on a pull bar angle? 
higher than 15 degrees. Uh, that that seems to be a pretty go-to you know, in that neighborhood of 15 degree range, depending on where you're at on your car. Um, we've tried more angle. More angle gets you quicker traction, but doesn't last as long. Uh, less angle, you know, anywhere from 10 to 15 degrees. Less angle sometimes maybe makes the car a little too quiet. A little, it doesn't respond quite so snappy. Um, Frank the Tank, IMCA Sport Mod, why do you tow the rear trailing arms in, on, in and not both towards the infield? so that the car is on the bars we've just that's just something that the way the car actually when we've, we've done it on the simulator the way the car actually rotates uh, and keep in mind when your car rotates the right rear is going to come underneath a, a little bit more so then it, it's going to run the right rear a little bit straighter a little bit more on the left rear, so we actually do them just both, so that the car actually. It's kind of like you know if you you, you take a, a stock car four link, I mean the standard always was to have the front towed in more than the back, and that's just the way we've always done it. I'm not saying that there isn't other ways to do it, but that's just the way we've always had good luck with it. One thing is always look at your your himes through travel. So, I mean, just because Bob says one inch on the left rear or two inch on the left rear, if you're going through the motion and your himes are bound up, then clearly you need to adjust your toe. So depending on the situation, right. it could be something that, you know, you, you also need to look at your car, the lengths of the barms, you know, get the right rear up in the wheel well, just like you are dynamically on the track and then feel them himes and make sure you're not bound up because it might be something that, just because we have a recommendation, your car is built different. And there's different scenarios there. So you always want to make sure that dynamically you look at that thing and make sure that you don't have a bind. And on a four-link car, you know, like hanging there on the chain with the cage indexed, the bars feel fine. But you go on the racetrack and you have the force on that cage, it's going to travel farther dynamically on the racetrack than it is hanging on the chain, uh, you, you know, in the shop on jack stands. So always inspect that stuff dynamically in the shop to make sure that you're not, you know, have a heim joint bound up at your full motion. Well, and like I always tell people, the biggest thing you can do is set your left rear chain, set the car at ride height, set your left rear chain to the point where you, you, you know what you've got, whether you've got five inches of chain or whatever the chain is. Uh, take the right front spring out, let the car down on the right front, jack up underneath the seat of the car till you hit that chain. And that's where the, that's going to be a good starting point to look at all of your suspension to make sure, like Chad said, that you don't have, you know, you went two inches of toe in on the left rear while, you, you know, maybe your car that produces a heim joint bind. And then, you know, maybe your car needs to be an inch and a half. And that's what, you know, like Chad makes all kinds of different spacers that you can move that stuff around very easily. Um, what would moving the right rear trailing arm do if you moved it forward or backward in addition to moving it up or down? Also, 11 inch right rear spring versus a 13 inch right rear spring. Um, if you moved it forward or backward, Um, well, you're, you're moving it forward or backward, you're changing the static toe. So in other words, you're actually putting lead in the car or you're putting trail in the car one way or the other. So if you're moving, the, you're moving it that way, that's going to change how the actual, how much static steer is put in the car then your dynamic steer is going to be changed by the angle of the trailing arm. 11-inch uh, spring versus 13-inch spring. 11-inch um, spring is definitely a good, a good system for making sure your uh, 
the spring table is a lot lower on the right rear. The problem with the 11 inch spring is sometimes I don't feel comfortable with the travel that we can get in that 11 inch spring. Um, you know, like I said, in, in my opinion, a 12 inch spring would be ideal. Uh, what we do on our, our sport mods is we use, Chad's got a, a nice drop cup for the right rear. And we use the drop cup to use the 13 inch spring to try to get that uh, spring table down a little bit lower and, and that works pretty well but if if a guy could actually go to a 12 inch spring uh, you know if they made a 12 inch spring i would think that would be ideal but once again i don't want to invest in a whole bunch of springs so because they would the spring companies will make whatever we want if i wanted 250 springs on the shelf of one part number um the pole bar angle three link usra b mod same thing jacob uh in in the pull bar wise in that 10 to 15 range our sport mods we run 15 degrees and that seems to work pretty good and that's pretty common you know when i've looked at other cars that's that's pretty common um what do you look for in a pull bar shock for a spring pull bar? 9010s aren't really 9010s, are they? Um, no, they really aren't, but kind of depends on who built the shock. I mean, it's one of those situations where a true 9010 off the shelf isn't a true 9010. Um, if it's actually built by a builder, they're going to have it a lot closer to that. Um, and, and with a spring bar, that's pretty much what we run is, is, is a 9-1. Uh, sometimes we run an 8-2 in, in that neighborhood. It just depends on what we want the car to accomplish and what the driver wants. Uh, sometimes a 9-2 a can be a little bit aggressive, but it works pretty good. Alex on a B-Mod, sliders in front of the left rear. Yes, I would definitely on a B mod. I would run the slider in front if I if I had my option. I definitely would run the splash slider in front. Um, the thing that's nice about the slider in front, anytime you work into axle wrap, now you're saying, okay, well I can't get any axle wrap because my B mod has a solid pull bar, but with the amount of steer that these cars have. They actually steer to the point where there's a lot of axle wrap in there. So you might as well take advantage of the axle wrap where that wraps into that spring and helps load, it loads that left rear and gets, gets the car loaded. Uh, my buddy Jeremy says, IVOC makes a 12 inch spring by five inch, 150 to 250 pound range. Well, what the heck? There's our answer to our solution. I had no idea that they made that. I might have to look at some of these catalogs once in a while here. <laughs> get, get myself aware of what's actually out there. That's pretty good. Um, on a B mod, Midwest mod, do I want the slider in front of it? Yes, you definitely do. Corey, thanks, Chad, for the awesome parts on my new stock car build. You guys are very helpful in everything and willing to explain it. I appreciate it much. You know, and, and well, that's the you. thing. Yeah, Cody. I mean, I'm quite sure Chad. Chad, thanks you, and I thank you. Um, that's the thing that's nice about the why we do what we do is the fact that we appreciate guys like Cody who buy their parts from us because we're here to help you guys, and, and we're, we're here to service you, and, and it kind of makes the whole world go around. And it's just like that, you know, uh, well, we're just willing to help. I mean, Chad's the same way. Whatever we can do to make sure you go faster, you win more races, we look better that way. You're more, you're comfortable with things and you had a hell of a lot better time doing it when you're winning. And uh, that's what we're all about is winning races. Amen. Uh, uh, Bill. 
Oh, we're five minutes over. Bill, over, after overtime. Yeah, AFCO by Harris. 15 2 left rear shock. Okay to keep sport mod on the bars. Um, there's actually more traction in less of a shock if you can keep the car on the bar by trail braking it and how the driver drives it. However, not everybody's able to drive the car that way or you know the situation uh, the situation doesn't allow us to actually go in that direction uh, because you know number one we, we need help keeping the car on the bar so the 15 two we still build a lot of them I mean that's the our standard left rear is a 12-2, but we still build some 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 guys that you know they, they, they like that shock better and it works pretty well. Oh, Jeremy says that's a new part. Well, thank God. I was gonna like, man, I'm really I'm way behind here. Um, John, thanks for the program. It's very good. Well, we appreciate that. Well, I'll tell you what, we're out of time and. Uh, We'll be back here in two weeks, so it'll be uh, January 16th, the day after Chad's going to release his Hopefully by then. app. And uh, everybody have a nice night and have a, have a good week, and we we'll look forward to seeing you in two weeks. Thank you.